Hello, anyone and everyone. I am Echo, and today we are exploring abduction. We're here outside of the gas station, which I just realized is named Rodeo Fuel. I never noticed that before. I don't think I've actually, uh... Obviously, if you're too close, the little bit of roof there would block off the sign. You won't be able to see it. I haven't actually looked at it from this far away before. But anyway, yeah, we're outside the, uh gas station we just opened it up at the end of the last episode and got in there and got a few new clues one of those new clues was a uh, sorry clues not cluths jesus one of those new clues was a phone number which hopefully goes right to this i wrote it down and uh it's kind of <laughs> i have to say i love the fact that they put a rotary phone in here because Frankly, if anybody who's too young tries to play this game, they probably wouldn't know what the fuck a rotary phone is or how it works. So yeah. Anyway, the number was one five 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 four uh, three five seven nine. Six eight. Okay, so six eight. All right. Now, did that do anything or not? Kind of thinking it didn't. Hmm. Hmm. Do I not know how rotary phones work? No, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure you just do the number you want and you turn it. That's how it works. My family used to own a rotary phone many, many, many years ago when I was a child. So I've seen them firsthand. Um, but maybe there's something else I'm missing. Maybe you're supposed to dial zero or something first? I don't know. Hmm. You know what? I, and, I mean, there's no phone on here, so if it did do something, how would it work. We obviously can't call a number. Let's try dialing zero for the operator. Let's do it a few times. No. Okay. Um, maybe, because I know I actually came over here and I messed with the phone a little bit earlier, so um, maybe the numbers that I put in before kind of messed it up. Um, if that's the case, then dialing zero for the operator should have corrected it. Should have sort of reset it, basically, is what I'm trying to say. So, let's try it again one more time. Six and... Eight. Hmm? No. Nope. Doesn't seem to have done anything yet. Huh. Okay. That's probably something we'll need to worry about later, I guess. Alright, so, in here... Uh, what else was there that we missed? Or not missed, I guess. What else was there that we uncovered, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. we got this robot here, and we've got this nifty little sheet that shows us various numbers. Um, and I assume these would be in order, 1 through 12, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm going give, to give this a quick read again real quick. Uh, the lane number system is base 4. Drag from one blob to another to form the Valane digits. Drag between blobs to disconnect. The standard panel has five digits, but single-digit panels are also used. Use only first digit to simulate a one-digit panel. Zero to three. All panels will autocorrect for invalid entries. Okay. All right. So basically, um, we're going to need a number to put into this machine and this weird rubbery like this thing that gets like stretched out and returned 
Looks so weird. <laughs> this is apparently uh, all to do with that. As you can see here, we put these numbers in and it, uh, or not put these numbers in, we put these symbols in. Okay. How about we enter that? No? Hmm. Is there some other thing on this robot that we're missing? Yep. Okay. So that's one. Alright, just like we thought. Um, let's try that one. So, to remove these, we just drag between completed blobs, right? Nope. Okay, clear it then. No, we don't clear it? Okay, for some reason, clicking enter removes that. Alright, um, the next one would be that shape there. And, uh, so that's two. Okay, so yeah, so far these are in order. Um, also, why is, hmm, hold up a second. Okay, so clear did do it that time, for some reason. Oh, wait. Wait a minute. And three makes it appear on there. Oh, but that's not in the order that it's on the machine there. Um. Hmm. Well, shit. Let me. All right, I'm gonna take a moment and I'm gonna go silent and I'm gonna edit this out if I remember to. Please let me remember. <laughs> um, I'm gonna try and just basically jot all of these down, symbols and everything. So. I will return in a moment. Okay, we're back, and holy shit, that took way longer than I thought it was going to. So, um, basically, um, I mean, I, I could have actually sat here all day literally going through every single number. Um, you can do it either way in the machine. You can um, put in the number first, which I, f I figured out that actually the reason that pressing enter resets it is because when it's on zero, if you press enter, it makes that show zero, which is that none of the lines are connected. Um, but yeah, you can just put in any freaking number combination at all, hit enter, and it'll replicate it on there. And so you could just keep going through um, every single possible number that you could imagine and copy them all down, but obviously that would take forever and be entirely pointless. Um, and then you can also, you know, do the opposite of, uh, you know, smack stuff around into just whatever shape you want. Do that. If anything is wrong, it'll autocorrect to try to guess what you're doing. Oh, look, it's 85. Okay, so basically, um, the way it works is uh, basically through the, the same way as, uh, what's it called, Roman numerals, basically, where that's the symbol for one. And that's the symbol for two. And it goes up to four, whereas Roman numerals go up to five. Um, and after, you know, you know, with a Roman numeral, the number, the, the symbol for five is a V. And if you want to make a symbol for six, you put the symbol for one in front of V. And with this, it works very similarly, where if you want the symbol for well, uh, 5 is actually an original symbol. Uh, we'll just put it on here to show you. Uh, 5 is that. And if you want to do 6, you just add 5 and 1. And 1 is that. Or, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Because this works on fucking 4 digits instead of 5. Roman numerals are, are 5. So... This is fours, so the symbol for four is that right there. Those two dots just connected like that, that's the symbol for four. 
that is the symbol for 1. You put 1 and 4 together and you get 5. So that's basically how it works. Um, and that it works that way up to like 16 I believe. And then for some reason after 16 this right here is the symbol for 18 if I remember correctly. We'll uh... No, 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 clear, 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 18. There's 18. That's it right there. As you can see, 18's right there. Um, but 18 actually, if I remember correctly, this is the part that kind of confuses me. If you put 16 up there, it's that. But then these two symbols, let's try to clear this and... Uh, Actually, enter zero. This and that, and then we do that. That's two. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but then, god damn it! Now I don't even remember the part that confused me about this while I was trying to copy them all down. Okay, um, let's go to nineteen and see what that is. And that would be three plus. Yeah, that'd be 3 plus... What the fuck was it that confused me then? I can't remember. There's a part about this that didn't make any sense, but now that I'm redoing it here... Okay, never mind. I think it was actually... Yeah, I think it was 22 that confused me, because this is the symbol for 18, and that's the symbol for 4. So it so it's... Instead of... Uh, that's, that's right. The thing was, every fourth number, 4... 8, 12, uh, and 16 all had original symbols, whereas the symbol for 22, instead of being an original symbol, is, uh, it just looks like 18 plus 4, which is, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm fucking stupid, I'm sorry, 20 should be the original number. Because, to, what am I thinking? 22 is not a multiple of 4. So 20 is the... Did I write down 20? Did I forget to write down 20? Is that what messed me up this whole time? I forgot to write down freaking 20. Oh my god. Let me write that down real quick. <laughs> Jeez. I can't believe... Okay, so that was the part that confused me. Because I'm an idiot who forgot what I was doing. Okay. So, there you go. 20, you get the line there and the line there, and woo, everything else isn't filled in. Woo, ho, 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 okay. So yeah, basically it's actually a relatively simple system. Um, it just uh, deals in really big numbers, much bigger numbers than uh, in Riven, because in Riven there was a very similar puzzle, kind of like this, where you had to figure out symbols that represented numbers. Um, and in that game, you were only really required to know up to, like, 24. And in this, um, it's given us some pretty damn big numbers. That right there, uh, bottom right corner there, that's uh, that stands for 1,000. Um, and let me take a look at my notes real quick. Um, this one is 649. Uh, this one is 158. And then this one's 46, you know? So it, it, it's this is dealing with much bigger numbers, though I don't know if we're actually going to ever need 1,000 or 640, whatever. You know, I don't know if we're actually going to need those at any point in the game. It might just be there to show that these people were taking their time to study everything, to try and work it all out. Um, but yeah, it is a relatively simple system if you think about it the same way as the Roman numerals. The system in Riven was actually a bit more complicated because in that one, um, it was a five base system, just like Roman numerals, but after like 10 or something like that, it started doing something where the symbols would be turned on their side. So like one was an original symbol, and five was an original symbol, and 10 was an original symbol, but then after a certain point, it was like, okay, this is, like, fuck, I, can't, I don't remember now, it's been too long, I can't describe it correctly. It, 
Uh, whatever. We're not playing Riven, so I'm not going to explain it right now. I'll explain it in the future if I ever do a Riven playthrough. Oh my god. I can't... My, my brain hurts so much from having to copy all that stuff down. But basically, okay, we've got... We've got their number system down. We've got it written well enough. The phone number didn't do jack shit. Oh, okay. So now I'm just... Gotta figure out where else to go. So, um... Let me take a look at the map real quick, since it's out here, and it'll help us think things through. Um, we got power on everything. We've got, uh, let's see, we've got the, the scrapyard. The scrapyard didn't have much in it. There's a, like, a little bridge under there, sort of bridge type thing, or more like a stairway, I guess, that's not complete. It's been broken. Uh, I guess, actually, ramp. I guess that's, I guess that's, uh, what the ramp power is going to. Huh. Okay. Cool. Um, and there's the tower up there with that door. That door was locked, but it didn't have power earlier. And obviously, we've got the power going right there. Power's been going the whole time. I hope it stays on the whole time. I hope we don't have to, like, charge that back up or anything. But yeah, this is locked. And the. Uh, hmm. Not sure how to unlock it. But there is that other place. Uh, we got the code. For the door, the locked door, that's right. That's something we can go check, since we got the code for that. The, uh, I, guess I assume this code goes to that locked door. Yeah, it's right there. Because we found the note when we were up in the workshop tower type of thing that said that the code for the locked door was Farley's address backwards. And I wrote that down as well. Right here. So, 6341. 6341. Now, let's assume this is the right door. 6341. Awesome. Alright. There you go. Oh my god. Wait a minute. This is Farley's house. That actually makes a lot of sense. If you think about the way the world is uh, set up, this would be right behind her house. Okay. Let's look around for clues. I can't remember. Do we have a flashlight in this game? Because it's kind of dark in here. I don't remember. I don't think we do. Pretty sure we don't. Ah, poker. Cool. Ooh, a better map of the place. Okay. Okay, so Farley's Cemetery, Entry Canyon, that's where we came in. Oh, that's interesting. The fact that they call it the Entry Canyon um, implies that that's where everybody shows up when they enter the place. Right up there. So that's cool. Okay. Um, battery Shop. Oh, yeah, shop. So, workshop, like we called it. CW's town. Water source, the mysterious water source that just appears. Falls, wall, tower. Tree, more wall. Rail yard, bleeder lake. Interesting. Very interesting. Fuel, supplies, scrapyard, plateau. Bosque? Basque. Okay, it's obviously a French word, but I'm not sure what that means. I'm guessing forest? They decided to call it forest in French just for the hell of it? Alright. Anyway, but uh, obviously the point of this is to show all of the different... As you can see by these green markers, this shows all of the different locations that we can walk into the force field and be teleported somewhere else. We already um, went over here. Actually, wait a minute. We went up here first when we were on the train car. And that took us over here to the plateau, which was up by the scrapyard. And from the plateau, we came down here. The door was locked. Then we went in this one, which took us out here. 
up by the caves system up here where the where the we saw the first glow bug and then we went in through the cave because we had destroyed the uh the i want to say hallucinogenic rocks but they weren't i can't remember the word fuck the hologram rocks and that took us out down here which was inside the scrapyard then we unlocked the door and we were able to bring the thingy in okay so that's all well and good so what's this then this would take us out on the wall because it, it, it's actually if you think about it it's wait a minute no it wouldn't this would take us out right here onto the cemetery did we ever try entering through the cemetery i don't think we did um i know i i do remember the blue wall being there on the cemetery but i don't think we actually went through it i'm gonna again sketch this down real quick um just oh fuck i just hit the mouse okay anyway um you know what shortcut it won't take me nearly as long to jot this down because i'm just gonna do a rough sketch but i'll still cut it here for your uh convenient pleasure or whatever okay so this is absolutely beautiful here so basically um everything the the way it lines up makes it actually really easy to figure out where everything is so as we already talked we first went in um in through here by the cave in through the cave by the cemetery it took us out onto the plateau right here and then from there we came down here and it took us out there then we went in the globo cave and then went to the scrapyard so since we know where those are because we've already done them um i've written down on the map i've numbered each of the entrances so that um i, I numbered this number one and that number one to know that they match up and these number two number two number three and number three um and then it's basically easy um, because of the way these all line up, they're all um, not parallel, I don't remember what the word is, but they're all straight across from each other, you know? Like if you took a ruler and you laid a ruler across the map, uh, it would line up in a straight line to each one. Um, obviously, well, maybe not on this map because the person who hand wrote it didn't write it, you know, perfectly straight, um, but in real life they would line up that way. Um, so it's easy to see that um, this one in the cemetery would uh, take us over to uh, right here on the uh, south side of the wall, uh, but it would be on the other side of the river, which we could not access before. Um, and this might actually, I'm, I'm not sure, this one right here, I'm not sure if this would be on the plateau or not. The map does not make it clear. I do remember when we were down here walking through the forest after we had just gotten past that, the, the turning wall that was on, that was being hit by the water. There was a section of ground over here, um, that obviously was not on the plateau that we couldn't get to earlier. So I'm not sure if this maybe it leads into a cave or maybe it leads uh onto solid ground or maybe it's just another section on top of the plateau that we couldn't access before um but then obviously here at one end of the wall that connects to the other end of the wall down here um this area which i think we actually were able to get to but it wasn't i don't think i went in there before because we, we didn't have the barrier down when i went over here first when I went over here first, the barrier was still solid. We couldn't teleport through it, so I never tried, and I haven't been back over there yet. Um, but I do remember that spot being there, and that would take us over here to the north side of the wall, where there was a uh, locked door on the other side of the river. And then down here uh, by Bleeder Lake, with that big, strange contraption in the middle that was like a radio tower sort of looked like that we saw um that one uh would lead back to the area up by the water source that we saw before um obviously we can't get down here so it seems the goal in order to get there would be to go back up to the water source but that would require getting the water running again because the elevator that led up to the water source was not working because it was being pushed by the the water on the uh the small water wheel thing that it had built into it 
but when we changed the, the water flow that wasn't working anymore and we actually couldn't put the water flow back even if we could get up there so that's gonna be tricky certainly certainly tricky um but of course this is only the known map of the area as far as the people who lived here were able to discover it so maybe at some point we'll find another entrance to teleport somewhere else i could see for example the cave the entry canyon that we came through i could see maybe having another section of the barrier back here like if there was a hidden thing or something i'm not sure we'll we'll see we'll figure it out um but for now let's just look around the rest of the house because there's got to be more stuff all right uh that's the way we came in right over here oh can we pull this down oh okay that's cool actually looks like the number 15 if you look at it slightly sideways but that should be a number from the numbering system looks like it could be i mean it's on the same uh diagonal slope and everything um that looks like hooey what would that be got the whole thing written down here but you know what, actually, we could just go back to the machine and input this, uh, this, whatever you call it, shape thing. So let me just write this down real quick with the straight line on the side and then these going in, like, the shape of a five like that. Okay. That's actually, um, I just realized that actually is the only number I've seen so far, assuming this does get input into the, uh, create the machine thing back there. This is the only number I've seen so far that actually has every single dot covered. There'd be one here, 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 and one here. It has every single dot connected in some way, uh, to, to another dot. I mean, not all connected to each other, obviously. But yeah. Alright, so, oh boy. Oh, is this story stuff? It's story stuff that I can't bloody read. Um, hmm. I shall document the... I, I shall document the curious events that have transpired with myself, my family, friends, and co-workers. Hartnell was a peaceful mining town. Um, oh, not Hartnell, fuck, I don't remember the, I don't remember the name of the town now, god damn, oh well, anyway, it's a peaceful mining town, founded by my grandfather, and nest, nestled within the red rock of the desert on the Arizona territory, it's 163, it's 163 inhabitants heard a Mighty explosion on the night of June 27th, 1903. Okay, so now we've got a solid time period. Uh, this all, the, the town first got abducted in 1903, by the looks of it. Anyway, I'm going to keep reading. I sent several workers through the town to verify that the explosion had not caused any injuries or damage to uh, mining equipment. They reassured and wait a minute no they returned and reported that it must have been a loud god it's so hard to write, read this loud clap of thunder caused by lightning for they found no damage it was not until the light of the next morning that we were amazed to realize something profound had indeed occurred. As some... Jesus! I sound like some middle schooler standing in front of class reading a school report. This is ridiculous. As some... something destroy that night? And... our entire mining facility and a large circle of the land around it seemed to have been scooped up and carried off to a completely 
different place, all without anyone knowing about it. Yeah, okay, so just describing the abduction event. Oh, God, one more. All right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are these species description mofang? No, okay. I thought these might have been somebody rewrote down the <laughs> the stuff that was on these, but in a modern, you know, better pen. All right. The entire landscape outside of our circle of desert could only be described as alien as alien. Large floating rocks could be seen on the di in the distance. No one had even seen anything like it anywhere on Earth. We fully explored our new surroundings, hoping to find a way home. No way home was ever found. In fact, we soon discovered what we take for granted now. Not only could we not get back home, we also could not access the landscape outside the desert. Curiously, we discovered that a flow of water was provided from a high point of neck, a high point of rock, and we discovered a small tree growing on the very corner of the circle, our, uh, in the very center of the circle, our center tree that is so important to our lives here was just a mere sapling back then. Okay. Hooey. All right. That's a lot to read. And there's more. So let's get through it. Species description. Mofang. Through ambassador seeds, the Mofang were the first non-human species humans were introduced to. An Liang was the first to call the alien a Mofang. Impressed with their advanced ability to imitate our sounds, movements, and mannerisms, although they have a name for themselves, their language is mostly unpronounceable by humans. As a result, and because of their mimicry abilities, communication with the Mofang is primarily accomplished by learning their human languages rather than humans learning to speak Mofang. They have been able to learn almost every human language represented in Hunrath, enough to provide functional, if rudimentary, communication. The Mofang... Uh, basic external morphology is remarkably humanoid. Bilateral symmetrical tetrapods, bipedal, head with anterior facial features, mouth, eyes, nostrils. Other external features include min minimal body hair and raised dorsal protrusions. Constitution is somewhat frail, due apparently to their thin and lightweight internal structure, but internal investigation has not been possible. They have ample cranial space to account for substantial brain, and their intelligence is impressive as evidenced by their advanced technology. Alright. Communication. Talking with our neighbors. We take communication for granted, even with the varied languages we find here in Hunrath. But when we suddenly find ourselves among other intelligent species who don't share our culture, history, DNA, or vocal cords, it requires a huge amount of effort for the beginning of rudiment rudimentary chatting. This quick overview will set the stage for what to expect when communicating with our neighbors. The Mofang were the first non-humans we met. With at least some level of similar physical vocal generating abilities, they picked up human words quickly. This early mimicry resulted in what the species became to be called. Even though they were able to mimic single words and simple phrases, it became evident over the years that huge grammatical differences were not easily overcome. Some have proposed that dif the difficulty may have arisen because the Mofang insisted on attempting to learn every human language, and as a result were never able to lock onto any consistent grammatical structure. Nevertheless, in spite of the rudimentary sentence construction, it has been very easy to... Okay. Again, there's black bars on the bottom. Like somebody deliberately rubbed charcoal over it. So weird. Also, actually, before I continue with this, let me check here. I didn't think maybe... Yeah, there's... Oh, I, yeah, there's more to... Okay, so that's what the Mofang look like. Kind of typical aliens, actually. Oh, and there is more. There's more. There's so much more. Oh, geez. Okay. Let's flip that back down. Let's read this one first before we go on to the other. Awry. After a certain level of maturity and health of the tree, a passage opened at its base. This passage allowed contact with two additional species. The first contact was with the Arai. The first contact revealed the Arai to be large, beetle-like insects. Oh, those are the glow bugs that we, that we saw. We were unable to communicate directly with them in any way, but they appeared to have some rudimentary level of intelligence. It was Lorine Toth who first made the journey through the heart to Kaptar and named both the New World and the Inhabitants. 
the Arai have three distinct variants that have come to be referred to as Barnacle, Beetle, and Polyarch, although their morphology is blah blah. In their Barnacle stage, the Arai are completely immobile. The Arai stay in this egg-like development state seemingly indefinitely. In order to hatch, they must be in proximity of a polyarch and fertilized by the beetles after a certain stage of maturity. The beetles are the eyes and ears, hands and feet. With only a minimal nervous system of their own, they are essentially the sensory extensions of the immobile polyarchs. They are able to execute simple commands, but apparently have very little in the way of individual sentience. Yep, little bugs. The Arai polyarchs are the intelligent and consciousness of the species. Although it was obvious that there was intelligence behind the species, it wasn't until Caroline Farley began spending large amounts of time in close proximity that deeper communication began. With a room nearby, Farley was the first to communicate non-verbally and learn much about the species. Wait. With a room nearby? But What's the point of that? With a room nearby? That's weird. That doesn't seem to fit in the rest of the sentence at all. Doesn't seem relevant. Anyway, Riley was the first to communicate non-verbally and learn much about the species, including some historical information. The Arai species survived in their world while several other sentient species came and went. Among them, an ancient species who formed a deeper relationship with the Arai, carving temples and dwellings for them in the rocks, and later, a more recent... Yeah. That would, uh, I guess, be a polyarch or something? Or one of the egg type of ones of the Arai? Okay. Valane. The final species to be discovered were the Valane. The Valane had been communicating with the Arai for many years through ambassador seeds, but became part of the large, larger community very shortly after the Arai. With a large and imposing frame and a form of communication based on a complex, multi-voiced, low-frequency rumble, the initial introductions were intimidating. After several attempts, Emily Vidal was able to begin some rudimentary communication and began visiting the Valane in Marais, which she named on a regular basis. She discovered a complex and a mating society that was able to use blah blah blah. Unlike the other worlds, the Valane Sphere is scooped out of a Valane resettlement group that was preparing to set off into space to find a new home world. This was their way of life, to put themselves into stasis and scatter themselves throughout, through the stars. As mentioned previously, their appearance is imposing, standing about nine feet tall with a distinct reptilian resemblance. They have six limbs, two muscular legs and arms, and a smaller set of arms. They control every aspect of their technology with their vocalizations, but over the years they have created control panels based on their number system that allowed other species, blah blah blah. So that's them. Okay. Wow, they're a lot uglier than I was imagining. Okay, that's all for that one. Now let's continue on this one. Um, this is talking about the communication with the Mofang, so communication with the Vlaine. The Vlaines pr have presented a particular communication challenge. From what we can gather, they produce sounds using two large reed-like structures inside opposite sides of their heads. The vibrations generated are channeled to resonance chambers in their skulls, where they are combined into a complex, low-frequency dual tone. The low-frequency bitonal sounds are not only heard for humans to hear, are not only hard for humans to hear and resolve, but impossible for us to mimic. And the Valanes hearing. And the Valane's hearing is also oriented toward low frequency, so they are unable to hear most sounds associated with human speech. Therefore, communication with the Valane has relied on technology. They have adapted consoles, yes, okay. Some higher frequency characteristics of certain key Valane words over the years, and although we can't speak to them in a way that the Valanes can understand, we are occasionally able to hear and recognize these words when spoken distinctly by the Valane. If you'd like to learn more about communication with the Valane, please contact Vito. Arai. None of the stages of the Arai morphology have any vocalization apparatus. Because of the obvious synchronization of the barnacle flash and the ability of the pawns to provide for to provide for and address the needs of the polyarchs, it was assumed that the species could communicate effectively. It was not until Farley began to spend large amounts of time in the polyarch antechamber that the first clues to this communication became evident. After months of research, Farley began to have limited success with receiving some kind of simple messages that were coming from the polyarchs. It is apparent now that the polyarchs had been to listen. Both the polyarchs and the pawns have a simple organ that can sense human vocal frequency, enabling them to sense simple responses from humans, but over the simple responses from humans. But over the years, Farley was able to learn to speak to the polyarchs via a related form of extrasensory transmission. If you'd like to learn more about communication within the Arai, please contact Farley. Alright, 
So that's all for those. And now we got... Jeez, we still got the rest of the house to look through. But I've already gone way over my time for this episode. So I'm going to have to end it here at a mo in a moment. Let me just look at this real quick. Seed information. All right. Okay, that's a lot to read. We're going to... You know what? Ugh. Fuck it. Might as well. It's only actually three pages or something. Okay, so Ambassador Seeds. Ambassador Seeds were first documented about 150 Earth years ago. They occur about once every 400 days if the trees remain healthy. Natural uh, seed swaps occur between pairs of seeds that, we now know, dropped simultaneously from healthy trees in paired sphere. When each seed was touched by a species in sphere, the swap occurred, sending an ambassador from each sphere to the paired sphere. So, I guess these things that came and abducted the people, those were the ambassador seeds. Location of the swap is defined by the locations of the pairs of seeds. After the first swap, the seeds recharged quickly, allowing for a quick return. First meetings were intense, but naturally short. It was quite a surprise for both the Mofang and us. Over time, the seeds required more time to recharge. Collector seeds. Everyone who arrives is familiar with the collector seeds. The bright light that we were all drawn to... Oh, whoops. Sorry, that's the collector seed. Never mind. I was getting confused. Anyway, collector seeds. Everyone who arrives is familiar with the collector seeds. This bright light that we were all drawn to right before the event that brought us here is a collector seed. What new arrivers may not be aware of is that these seeds, like all seeds, come in pairs. When the tree drops a collector seed on the ground, it signals that its twin has begun its quest for a new... Uh, a new being. Okay. That search may take hours or it may take years. When an appropriate situation, a natural threat of death, is found, the seed activates and swaps a smaller but varying uh, but varying sighted sphere from Earth or whatever appropriate homeworld here to Hunrath. As Hunrath became more populated, we would watch for a newly dropped collector seed, collect it, and place it in the entry canyon area. Oh, okay. So where the seed is determines where people pop up. This allowed us to... Blah, blah, blah. Unlike ambassador seeds and mother seeds, collector seeds do not seem to survive. The inner core is spent, leaving only the lifeless outer husk. Mother seeds. Uh, postulated but unverified. First suggested by Alima Hamsa, the notion of mother seeds extrapolates the behavior of lesser seeds to a super seed. She posited that the process that actually created the paired spheres was similar to all other swaps, but on a much grander scale. The idea is that two seeds from a mother tree were scattered on the galactic winds to find appropriately similar environments. When matches were found, some process was triggered that swapped large portions of landscape between vastly different worlds. Alima further noted that the tree's location in the center of the spheres suggested that the trees grew from these mother seeds. Because of the similarities, it has been blah blah blah. All right. No more pages after that, and I'm all out of time, so that was a big dump of story and details, and all of it's pretty interesting. It's actually, uh, they're building the world quite well in a lot of ways that I wasn't expecting. Um, Mist and Riven sort of talked about the events that had transpired, and it gave minor details on, like, the people that lived there. Um, so far, Abduction seems to be giving a lot of details on the people that lived there, including the alien species, of course. And it also, uh, it's also been giving a lot of detail on, like, the technology and how that all works. And that's kind of, uh, that's interesting. It's not exactly details that are necessary, but, uh, it's good to have them. It makes the game feel more alive, I suppose you could say. But anyway, so yeah, I'm all out of time. I hope you all have enjoyed this, and I hope you will continue to enjoy it. And holy crap, this episode's going to be <laughs> horrible to edit. But uh, oh well, it's worth it. I'll see you all next time. Bye bye <laughs>